Hello, hello, and welcome to today's service. How are you doing back at home? I hope that you're doing well. My name is Esther Wanza, and I am your host for today. Praise the Lord. I'd just like to encourage you with the word of God that says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. I know you may be asking, which gates are we entering? You know, because you are not meeting physically for some of us. But you know, it is the gates of his presence. So if you're here, you have already entered a gate. You may not have entered the K3C gate for some time, but today we are entering into his courts with praise, and that is the, the gates of praising him. So praise the Lord today. We look forward to having a wonderful time with the Lord, even as we sing and as we hear his word today. Do you have anybody that is visiting with us for the very first time? Is it your very first time to be on this page? If it's your first time, you're very welcome. This is the Church of Courageous Witnesses, the home of Tandaza Groups, and, and would like to get in touch with you. You can just let us know that you're a visitor in the comment section, or you can get in touch with us through this number that I'm going to share just right now, 777 669 Would like to get in touch with you and just hear from you. Uh, if you're visiting, uh, we are very glad to have you. But if you're looking for a church, we'd like to welcome you even as we get to know you much more. Um, at this point, I'd just like to encourage us, uh, and I hope that we have been built even as we have been going through the series, Arise and Build. I hope that you're getting blessed. And so as I welcome the worship team, I'd like us to pray together. So let's believe and pray together. Mighty everlasting King of glory, we come before you, Lord, this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts for yet another Sunday that you have given us, O God. Father, we know that you have something for each and every one of us, O King of glory. And we pray that, O God, that your presence that is in this place is going to minister to each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would touch everybody that, come, that came expecting to hear from you, O God. And I pray the Lord where the burdens are heavy, the Lord, they will be lifted. Those that are seeking you, O God, to hear your word and to be answered concerning a situation, O God. May there be a word for them in the name of Jesus. Those that are, those of us that are seeking direction, God, on the way to go on a certain matter, Father, may you answer us in the name of Jesus. And as we are in your presence, O God, may we be enriched in every way in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We give you praise and we honor you and we pray this trusting and believing in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody say, Amen. Amen, amen. So I'd like to welcome the worship team. Uh, help me welcome the worship team by clapping for them. Let's clap for them, guys. Somebody make a joyful noise. Hey. Woo. Hallelujah. Great, lovely, wonderful morning for us to praise God and exalt his holy name. All right, this God that we serve, he's so mighty even to fight your battle. Hallelujah. Join us today. Make room. Dance to the Lord. All right. So just clap your hands to Jesus. You can clap, 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 clap. clap. All right. All right. All right. All right. Yay.
Oh, 
goodness of God because he is with me. Now the word assures me that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, oh, I fear no evil. Why? Because the Lord is with me. Even though you may be facing a tough time, I just want to encourage you and tell you that he is Emmanuel. He is with you. So may your praises rise still to him. In whichever place you are in, whatever station of life you are at, let your praises rise to our Lord and Savior. to be 
Time that sings all I want, yes, is for you, Lord, you, Lord, to be glory, you, Lord, yes, for you, you to be lifted. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody just celebrate him, just celebrate him, celebrate him, just celebrate him, celebrate him. I'm just saying, cause all I want is for you, for you to be glorified, for you to be lifted high. all I want is for you to be glorified for you to be lifted up high oh God Lord we thank you for this time and this time of worship and of praise we thank you because of your presence you have promised that you will dwell in the praises of your people and you continue to do this Lord and therefore today we say all we want is for you to be glorified. All we want and desire is that you may be lifted up high in our lives and in this place. And today we worship you, Lord. Today we look to you and we worship you. And we bless your name, even this morning. Psalms chapter 90. Psalms chapter 90 says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. Throughout all generations before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting you are God from everlasting to everlasting he is God and so could we just lift our hands to him today and bless the name of our God from everlasting to everlasting he is God he has been our dwelling place through all generations our Lord you have been our dwelling place through all generations you continue to be the same a faithful God who never leaves nor forsakes his people and today we exhort you and we declare that you O oh God have been our dwelling place throughout all generations even before the mountains were born before you brought forth the earth or the, or the heavens or the seas Lord you have been God and you remain to be our God and our Savior you are God and then verse 3 says, you turn people, men, back to dust. And you say, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. Lord, today we remember that we are mortal. Today your word reminds us that we are just but dust. And therefore, Lord, we stand in all of you. We stand in all of the great King and the great God. Our lives are to your glory and to your honor. And today we remember that we have nothing else beside you. You are the one we look to. You are the one who gives meaning and life even to us, O God. Through you we'll move and we have our breath. And therefore today we bless you and we honor you. Through the life that you have given us, we proclaim you our God even today. 
Lord, even as we continue, we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a mourn. Our days come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days, O God, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Father, even as you remind us of our mortality, Lord, you also remind us today, help us to number our days. Help us to number our days, O God, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us what to do, how to turn, where to go, and what to do, even with the seasons of our lives. Teach us, Lord, how to live, for you are our God. Oh God, help us and teach us how to number our days aright. Because you are the Lord and because you, may, you give meaning to our lives, oh God. Therefore help us, lead us and guide us in the way we should go. And that Father, we say yes to you, yes to your will, yes to your spirit who gives meaning even to our lives, who helps us to know the way to turn and how to go. Therefore Father, even today, for everyone who is seeking you, for direction, may you guide them. May you give them direction and counsel and wisdom. For anyone who is asking you, what will I do? Father, may you lead them by your good spirit, even to your will and to your promises, Lord. Today we look to you and to your promises, Lord, because you are the one who teaches us the way we should go. Relent, O oh Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfading love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Satisfy us, O God, and may our joy be found in you and in your word and in your promises. Satisfy us in the morning and daily with your unfading love. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor to their children. Father, bless us and be with us. Give us joy. Cause us to rejoice again. Again. Lord, Father, remember your mercy and your compassion. Do not turn against us, Lord. May you take away our sins as far as the east is from the west. And remember your mercy and your great compassion upon us and even upon our children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Father, we thank you that your favor is on us, Lord. We pray that the things that we do, you will establish them. We pray that we will not waste our years, O oh God, but that our lives will have meaning for eternity, O oh God. But that our lives will have meaning for eternity, Lord, that we will be established in your kingdom and do your will, Father, because you are our God. Establish, yes, the work of our hands for us, and may you be glorified, O oh God. May that which we do be in line with your purpose and with your will for our lives. I thank you, Lord, even as I bless your people today. We thank you for this new month and for this new thing that you're doing, even in this year. We thank you even as we come to the close of this year. We look to you and we know that you will establish us, and Lord, and that your name will be exalted of our lives. Hallelujah to you, our God. We praise you. We honor you. We worship you. We celebrate you, our God and our Savior, for indeed you have been good. Hallelujah to you, our God and our Savior. We look to you and we praise you because you are good to us and you continue to be good to us. We thank you. We worship you, for we pray all these things believing and trusting in Jesus name amen and amen and amen the Lord bless you and keep you so today we thank God for what he has in store for us so the promises God has given you for this year just know just keep looking to him because he he has good things in store for his people and so time has come for us to listen to his word and uh, so prepare, take your Bible, take your Bible uh, and listen to the word of God with expectation because the, this word is for you. Good morning, K3C and uh, 
Once again, it's a pleasure for me to be here to bring the Word of God to you. We are still in our sermon series in the book of Nehemiah. And today I speak on chapter 13. Uh, we entitle this sermon, Nehemiah's Final Reforms. In physics, the second law of thermodynamics states that in a closed system, things move towards the maximum state of entropy or disorder uh, wh whenever you have a closed system, things tend to go the way of disorder. And this basically means that in a system where there is lack of order or predictability, it leads to further gradual decline into disorder. That physical law has a parallel in the spiritual realm. Even among God's people, unless we are constantly fighting against it, things tend toward the maximum state of spiritual disorder. We live in a spiritually and morally permissive society. Unless we constantly wage war against the flesh, we tend to become more and more like the world around us. I came across some statistics shared uh, by the Global Pastors Network about American pastors. In this report, it stated that each month, 1,500 pastors in the United States leave the ministry because of moral failure, because of spiritual burnout, or because of contention in their churches. 50% of pastors' marriages in the United States will end in divorce. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. Almost 40% report that they have had extramarital affairs since beginning their ministry. I'm not aware of a similar research here in Kenya and perhaps I should make it my next project. But just from my basic interaction with pastors and as a pastor, I tend to think and I tend to imagine that our numbers may be similar. Or if they're not, then they are well-headed in a similar direction. Even if the truth were only half of those numbers, is it any wonder then that the church is not making a more significant impact in the world today? The changes in our cultural morals since my childhood days and compared to now are, to say the least, staggering. There was a TV show when I was growing up called Tushauriane. At the time, this show was considered as outright X-rated, and the government of the day banned it. I got a chance to watch some sections of this program the other day, and I compared it to what is airing on our televisions today, what we are watching with our children, and I was left wondering what was so wrong with it at the time. Today, explicit sexual references and scenes are commonplace. And yet we are bringing these things into our living rooms and watching these things with our children. We are in a state of moral decline. We continue to be in a state of compromise and the things that were an outright no, they today appear to be acceptable to us. And if we think that this cultural degeneration has not damaged the church, has not impacted the church, then we are blind. The supreme cultural value of tolerance toward everyone and everything has permeated the global church. But the slide into moral permissiveness is not a recent problem. 
In the book of Nehemiah, we find that Nehemiah faced it. Remember, he had taken leave from his position as a cupbearer for the king at Axaxis to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. Once the walls had been rebuilt, God used Nehemiah and Ezra to lead the people into a spiritual renewal. In chapter 10, the people signed, they entered into a covenant where they agreed to obey God's law as it applied both personally to, to them and also corporately uh, in their corporate worship. The climax of this book is the dedication in chapter 12, which we looked at last week. The people rejoiced because God had given them great joy. It would have been nice if this book ended at chapter 12 and verse 43, and they all lived happily thereafter. But unfortunately, real life is not like that. After 12 years as governor, Nehemiah had returned to Persia. Remember, he had taken leave, and now he needed to go back to his job. We don't know how long Nehemiah stayed there, but during his absence, the Bible records that spiritual permissiveness and decline set in. The time references in chapter 13 are not very clear. So we cannot really tell whether the reforms in chapter 13, verse 1 to verse 3, took place on the day of the dedication or at another time. But the reforms we see in verse 1 to verse 3 were short-lived. Spiritual compromise crept into the society through spiritual leadership. When Nehemiah returns back from working for the king, he finds that there was rampart and in some areas the people had slid into spiritual compromise. They had reneged on a covenant, a promise they had made to the Lord just a few years earlier. And a lesser man would have said, I give up. It's useless to try and reform these people. But not with Nehemiah. Nehemiah strongly confronted the perpetual problem of permissiveness. He confronted compromise. And his example teaches us various lessons. There are many things we can learn from Nehemiah. And I want to share them with you. Lesson number one that we can draw from chapter 13 is that to deal with spiritual permissiveness, we must be aware of the problem areas. The question for me is, why hadn't other people in Israel dealt with these problems? It is clear that Ezra at this point may have died. And uh, what about the other leaders? It is likely that they just didn't see these problems to the degree that Nehemiah did. Before the moral slide had set in, the people had listened to the reading of the scripture, which made them aware of God's standards of holiness for his people. Verse 1 to verse 3 of chapter 13 is inspired by the restating of the law by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3 to verse 5. And in that section of scripture, God declared that no Ammonite or Moabite should enter the assembly of Israel because of the way those nations had treated Israel when they were in the wilderness. The reason that God did not want Israel to mingle and to accept these foreigners into their midst was that they would corrupt Israel from following the Lord alone. And at some point, brothers and sisters, during Nehemiah's absence, spiritual compromise had crept back in. Please remember that it was Nehemiah, it was his knowledge of scripture that enabled him to see these deviations. 
Nehemiah understood what the scripture said. Had he not understood the scriptures, he would not have been able to tell that there was a problem. The only way that we will detect spiritual permissiveness in ourselves and in our church is by being grounded in God's word. So the big question for us today, what is it that cost this compromise? Verse 4 to verse 9, as you read that portion, you realize that there were some wrong relationships. The people allowed themselves to enter into wrong relationships. The temple contained some storage rooms, and these rooms were used for the grain offerings, the utensils, and the tithes that the people brought in verse 5. While Nehemiah was gone, Eliashib, the high priest, had cleared one large room and one smaller room. And he cleared them so that Tobiah, the Ammonite, could set up an apartment there. I want you to remember that Tobiah was one of the people who mocked Nehemiah, who strongly opposed Nehemiah during the rebuilding of the wall. But he had good connections. He had friends among the Jews and he had persuaded them that he was a good man. But meanwhile, as he did that, he was sending threatening letters to Nehemiah. But now here he is. The same same man who obstructed the people of God as they rebuilt the wall is now here, setting base, living in the temple. He's setting up a personal residence in the temple. So the question, what, what is going on here? Why would the high priest allow such a thing? Why would he allow an enemy of Israel to come and live in the temple? In answer to that question, I want to suggest that there were probably several factors. One was that the high priest and Tobiah were related through marriage. In, as we see in verse 4, they were related. Another factor was that Tobiah had a Jewish name which meant God is good. So he wasn't totally Ammonite, just partially. It's always more difficult to draw the line against a good person, in quotes, a good person, in quotes, who is just mixed up on some things than against an outwardly wicked person. It is difficult to live out a strict commandment of God's word, such as excluding the Ammonites from the assembly of Israel when your relative is an Ammonite, especially when he seems to be part Jewish. Theological permissiveness creeps in through the door of relationships with those who are partly right, but partly very much wrong. It is common in our day to hear Christians, men and women, believers in our day, siding with a politician because he appears to side with the church. We have recently seen in the elections in the U.S., how the church has rallied behind Donald Trump. Yet, when you look at the, Donald Trump's life, Donald Trump does not, in my view, represent anything that is godly, but the church has rallied around him. I want to say here today that, brothers and sisters, an Ammonite is an Ammonite, and we must be careful in our dealings with them. One of my professors when I was in college used to tell us that the two factors that would most determine where we would be in 10 years were the books that we read and the friends that we kept. Wrong friendships and associations can seriously damage us spiritually. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul addressing his spiritual son, Timothy, concerning those who hold a form of godliness but deny its power, he says to Timothy, 
avoid such men as this. Brothers and sisters, we must teach our children the danger of wrong relationships, wrong friendships, and we must teach them the importance of choosing friends who want to follow Jesus Christ. But there's something else that is happening here. The second thing that we notice is that there was financial permissiveness. There was financial compromise. And we see that in verse 10 to verse 14. This problem was connected with the first problem. Spiritual problems rarely occur in isolation. The high priest had moved Tobiah, an enemy, into the temple. And now there was not enough room. There were not enough storerooms for the tithes that the people brought. So the priests who relied on those tithes had not required the people to bring in their tithes. And as a result, the Levites had to go and find some other work to sustain themselves, to support their families, thus neglecting their temple duties. Spiritual permissiveness invariably has a negative effect on our giving. The prophet Malachi was ministering at this time and in that famous verse in Malachi chapter 3, he confronted the people for robbing God by not bringing their tithes into the storehouse. A third thing that was going on here is that there was permissiveness in the use of time. We see that in verse 15 to verse 22. Even though the people had agreed in their covenant with God to keep the Sabbath holy, in chapter 10 and verse 31, they quickly fell into doing business on that day. They no longer honored the Sabbath. Some merchants from Tyre were doing very good business, selling imported fish and merchandise in the city during the Sabbath. No doubt the Jews had excuses. They probably said that uh, if I don't uh, sell my grapes on that day, they will rot. Probably some would have said everyone else is doing it. Another one would have said, I, I can't compete if I close shop on this day. Another one would have said, all those important fish, imported fish will, will rot and go to waste if we don't buy them. It wouldn't be right to waste all that food. So they had excuses and they were good and valid excuses. I want to say this. We are not under the strict Sabbath laws of Israel. But like this, Jews, it is easy for us, it is easy for you and I to make up excuses for why we put business and our pursuit of pleasure ahead of worship. We give excuses. I'd like to spend some time alone with God every day, but I've got to work long hours. When I get home, I am exhausted and need some time to relax, so I'm unable to spend time with God. Excuses, excuses. I'd like to go to church more often, but Sunday is the only day that I'm able to sleep in and recover and have a leisurely breakfast so that I can go back to work the following week. Excuses. Spiritual permissiveness always affects how we spend our time. The fourth thing that we notice is that there was permissiveness in their homes. And we see this in chapter 23, uh, rather chapter 13, verse 23, up till verse number 29. Remember that Ezra had corrected this problem just a few years before. But here it was rearing its ugly head yet again. Nehemiah discovered that some of the Jews had married foreign women and their children didn't even speak Hebrew, which meant that they couldn't understand the scriptures. We need to understand that marrying an unbeliever will not only affect us, 
it also has a negative impact on our children. They will grow up speaking the language of Ashdod and not understanding the things of God. This is what had happened among the people of Israel. They had married unbelievers and because of that the next generation could not even understand the scriptures. There is no more vulnerable area of your life, brothers and sisters, than that of the emotional attachments that you form with the opposite sex. I have seen many men and women whose lives have been completely changed just because they associated with themselves with a the wrong person. Some ended up marrying the unbeliever. I have pleaded with some not to do it, but they went ahead and did it. They married the wrong person. They thought that they could change him or her, but in fact, this person ended up being the one changing them, and their lives have been turned upside down. Moral permissiveness always begins like an innocent trickle through the dam, but it certainly widens until the dam suddenly gives way. And at that point, the damage is so serious and widespread. How did Nehemiah confront this permissiveness? How did he deal with this state of compromise that was so rampant in his time? The second lesson we learn from our text is that to deal with spiritual permissiveness, we must strongly confront problem areas. Many people criticize Nehemiah for be, not being more tactful and polite. But when God's people are being poisoned by permissiveness, politeness may not be the best. If I saw you about to drink what I knew to be a deadly poison, that is not the time for me to be polite. I'm sure you'd want me to shout, wait, that will kill you. And if need be, you'd want me to forcibly knock the poison from your hand. And that's what Nehemiah did. He didn't worry about being polite or being diplomatic or what the people would think about him. I'm sure that he made many, many enemies by what he did here. But I'm also sure that he was God's friend. Many people no doubt grumbled about how unloving and harsh Nehemiah was. But I want to say here today, brothers and sisters, that it is far more loving to rudely knock the poison out of a person's hand than it is to smile politely and watch them drink the poison. In each of these situations, brothers and sisters, Nehemiah dealt with the problem head on. There are four aspects of what he did in dealing with this problem, and I want to share them with you. Number one, Nehemiah discovered the problem. Why hadn't other leaders in Israel perceived what was wrong and dealt with it? Nehemiah saw what others did not see. As I said earlier, the reason he saw it was that he compared what, we, what he saw with what he knew from the scriptures. Look at verse 7. This is what it says. I came to Jerusalem and learned about the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah. Nehemiah didn't refer to it as a creative alternative for, for the temple storerooms. He called it by what it was. He called it evil. That was not a popular word to apply to the high priest, but Nehemiah did not tone it down. In verse 10, it says that he discovered, he discovered the fact that the Levites had not received the tithes. In verse number 15, it says he saw the violation of the Sabbath. In verse number 23, it says he also saw that the Jews had married foreign women. 
in every case, Nehemiah observed what was happening. He compared it to God's unbending standards in Scripture, and then he took action. If we are going to deal with the problem of compromise in our time, if we are going to deal with compromise in our lives, in our churches, in our societies, we must be able to know that it is compromise. How do we do that? We do it by referring to the standard of God's word. We need to know the scriptures. After discovering the problem, what then does he do? Secondly, Nehemiah got upset. In verse number 8 and, and verse number 9, it says he was very displeased. In verse number 11, it goes on to say he reprimanded the officials. It doesn't take much imagination to picture Nehemiah asking with a raised voice why the house of God had been forsaken. In verse number 18 to verse number 19, he again reprimanded them for the Sabbath violations. And it is clear that he was upset. But the classic verse for me is verse number 25, where he got so upset that the Bible says he contended with them. He pronounced a curse against them. He struck some of them and pulled out their hair. Probably he was pulling their beards. What a guy this Nehemiah was. But as we look at this example of Nehemiah, brothers and sisters, I must caution that we need to be careful with righteous anger because we can easily excuse sinful anger. We can easily excuse inappropriate behavior. Uh, we can excuse sinful anger as being righteous. But when we see sins or false teachings that are damaging God's people, it is wrong for us not to be angry. To be complacent in the face of such evil is not to be like Jesus. What was the third thing that Nehemiah did? Nehemiah took strong, unmistakable action. It was very clear where he stood on this, on this particular situation. He didn't just say, it makes me mad to see how Israel is drifting from the Lord and then go back to read his newspaper. No, he met the problems head on. He personally threw Tobiah's household goods out of the storerooms. He went in, he carried Tobiah's furniture and threw them out. Then he had them cleanse the rooms and put the grain offerings back in there. Imagine how Tobiah must have reacted when he came home to find his furniture thrown out. I wish I could have seen the expression on his face. With regard to the tithes, Nehemiah not only reprimanded the officials, but verse 11 to verse 13 says he restored them to their posts and appointed faithful men to oversee the collection and distribution of the tithes. Concerning the Sabbath, he commanded that the doors be shut and locked on the Sabbath in verse 19 to verse 22. Then he, he went ahead and stationed men there to enforce it. When the merchants from Tyre camped outside the gates waiting for the gates to be opened, he warned them to leave or else he would use force against them. And he commanded the Levites to purify themselves and to stand as gatekeepers. Nehemiah took action. It was very difficult for anybody to be mistaken as to where Nehemiah stood. But what is our situation today in the face of compromise? Do people know where we stand? Do brothers and sisters, do our friends out there know where we stand? Or do we just keep quiet and go along with the, with the crowd? With regard to the mixed marriages, he not only strongly contended with those who are guilty, 
But when he found out that one of the grandsons of the high priest had married a daughter of Sanballat, he drove the young man away in verse number 28. He chased the man. I think that means that he actually kicked him out of town so that he could not defile the priesthood by succeeding his grandfather in the office uh, of the priests. But I want to give another caution at this point. Before we confront anyone in sin, we need to check the flesh and make sure that our motives are pure before God. Before you go and rebuke anybody, before you confront anybody, please make sure that your motives before God are right. Sometimes, and I dare say many times, a more gentle approach will be more effective. But we often are by thinking that gentleness means being nice. Jesus was gentle when he pronounced wars on the Pharisees, but he called them hypocrites, blind guides, and whitewashed tombs in Matthew chapter 23. Paul, filled with the Spirit, told Elimas, the magician, that he was full of deceit and fraud. He called him the son of the devil and an enemy of righteousness. And he goes ahead to strike him blind in Acts chapter, chapter 13, verse 9 to verse 11. Sometimes sin demands a strong and direct confrontation. Brothers and sisters, are you one who is able to confront sin? Sin around you, sin in your home, sin in your neighborhood. Are you one who is able to stand for righteousness, to take a stand for justice and confront sin? What was the fourth thing that Nehemiah did? He was accountable to God and aware of his presence in every situation. This was a man who walked around knowing that God was present. He lived his life in the presence of God. And therefore, he needed to account to God. Four times in verse 14, in verse 22, in verse 29, and again in verse number 31, Nehemiah utters brief prayers even in the midst of these situations. He was not taking this strong action against per permissiveness for his own sake. He was doing it for God's sake. Derek Kidner, in, a, in his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, says of these prayers, he says that Nehemiah's Godward focus is essential if we want to confront the permissiveness of our times with the right spirit. If we lose it, we can easily become self-righteous, moral crusaders, who, who look down on those who are blinded by sin. Living with an awareness of God's presence and that we must answer to him will give us the courage to stand alone if need be and confront out of love. Those are the words of Derek Kidna in his um, commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah at page number 130. But as we bring this to a conclusion, I have thoroughly enjoyed this series on Nehemiah. Nehemiah saw the fallen state of Jerusalem and he decided to do something about it. When you look at our society today, what do you see? When I look around me, I see a society that is on a decline. But what are we going to do about it? As the people of God in our time, what will we do about the decline that surrounds us? What is God calling you to do for his cause and for his church today? I also want to say that as we do something about it, as we see the faults in our society, as we see faults of others, it is easy for us to be blind to our own permissiveness. And I want to encourage you to begin with yourself. 
As you read God's word, ask yourself where you may have slipped into the ways of our godless culture. As you have had warnings during this series of spiritual dangers, as we have looked at the book of Nehemiah, as you have seen warnings of dangers that have been pronounced on this pulpit, what has been your response? Today, I want to urge you to stop and prayerfully consider whether what we say is in line with God's word. Go back and study this book. See for yourself what it is that the scriptures say and then do something about it. Don't allow yourself to remain in a situation of compromise. Spiritual permissiveness is a perpetual problem. And like Nehemiah, we must de detect it by God's word. And we must strongly confront it if we want to hear our Lord say one of these days, well done, good and faithful servant. Shall we bow our heads and, and pray? Heavenly Father, once again, we are grateful for your word. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 130 that the entrance of your word brings light. Lord, in this series, in this book, through this book of Nehemiah, you have given us light. What a relevant book for our time. We live in times of moral decline. We live in times of compromise and permissiveness. And the church has not been spared. My brothers and, and myself have not been spared. Lord, we need this word from the book of Nehemiah. Thank you for giving us your word. How I pray, everlasting Father, for my brothers and sisters, that as we embark on our lives, that we will receive your word and we will act upon your word, that we will not be hearers only, but we will also be doers of this word. How I pray, everlasting Father, that you will stir a revival in our hearts and in our souls, that we will rise up like Nehemiah, that we will, you'll stir up a godly anger and righteousness in our hearts so that we will stand out for the cross, stand out for Jesus in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, wherever we go, Lord Jesus. Please revive us so that we would shine for you. The world is in need of light, Lord. Please fill us with your spirit that we will shine for you. We want to shine for you. We want to honor you. K3C wants to have an impact for you. So I pray for this church. I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would have an impact in our generation. Oh, Father, please have mercy upon us. Where we have strayed, Lord, forgive us. But revive us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ron, for the word. Thank you for culminating even our series for us through the last two months. Or I must say for the last two months, we have been going through the book of Nehemiah. And the call to us has been to arise and build. And I pray that you have responded this far. Yet, I also want to say there's still time for you to respond, that you may come in and arise and build, not only in the church, but also in your personal life, in your family, that you get to respond to what God has spoken to you through uh, this season. I welcome you to give us feedback. I don't know what has been the highlight for this series to you. What has the Lord instructed you to do? So send us a message and tell us, you know, this is what God has spoken to me and this is what I want to do because arising and building is a matter of stepping out. And we pray that you shall step out and participate in what God has instructed you 
uh, to do. We want to come to a time of giving, and I'm reminded this afternoon of the words in Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 22 and 23, that says, The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. The Lord has been faithful to us. The Lord has watched over us thus far. And we want to come to give unto him because God has been faithful to us. The Lord has preserved us. The Lord has provided. And I know maybe to some the season also has been challenging. But even as we come this afternoon to give, that we can come in that very understanding of saying that great is thy faithfulness. That, Lord, I come to give unto you because you have been good to me, you have watched over me, and you have provided. And so we are going to project the giving platforms for us to give. But even as we come into a time of giving, allow me to pray for us even as we give unto the Lord this afternoon. So let us pray together. Father, we thank you that we look back into the air. Thus far we have come. You have been with us, and we come in the very same words to say that great is thy faithfulness. Lord, we come even in the same manner to give unto you, Lord, of our tithes, of our offerings, of our thanksgiving, and even towards the project of the church. We pray that, God, as we do this, O God, that, Lord, you may uh, bless us, O God. Father, we call unto you, Father, that, Lord, even as your people give this very day, that, Lord, indeed, you may bless them. Lord, you may increase them. Let them experience the blessings that come out of giving, Abba, Father. We bless you, Lord, even for this wonderful time, and even as we come to the end of this series, Lord, we thank you for Dr. Ron, Lord Almighty. We pray that, God, you may continue to increase him, uh, to renew him, and even to strengthen him, O oh, dear Father. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. And so, the giving platforms are there on your screen. So, let us give cheerfully unto the Lord today. This God that we serve will not let you down. This God that we serve will not let you fall. This God that we serve Well, the ear is 
over. <laughs> One more month to go, and 2020 shall be done. We go into a new month in expectation, and our prayer as the leadership of the church is that as we come into December, that the joy of the Lord shall be our strength. That December shall be a different month for us. December shall be a month that the Lord will just do great and mighty things for us. That as we come into December, truly we shall celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And so we welcome you to join us in the coming month of December as we go through the different Sundays, as we get to sing the Christmas carols, as we get to hear about a word in season regarding the season of Christmas, and we ask you to join us. We shall be more online in this month of December, and so we welcome you to participate and even to invite others to join us online uh, for our services. And as we come to the end of this service today, I want to declare the blessing of the Lord upon you, even as you go into the week, that the Lord may bless you. And so I pray that may the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may the Lord make his face to shine upon you, may the Lord answer you, even as you call unto him. May the Lord hear you, even in that deepest, you know, and that secret prayer that you have been making unto him. May you go forth this week victorious. May you go forth this week knowing that God is on your side. And I declare that you are blessed. I declare that you are provided for. I declare that you shall be of good health and that the blessings of the Lord shall be upon you even today and even in the coming week and even in the days to come in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and thank you. See you next Sunday. Sign